Our next speaker is Paul Sweeney. Paul is unusual. Um, he is representing the Institution of Engineers and Shipbuilders in Scotland, and he is a council member of, of the institution. But he's also had a career as uh, a member of the British Army, a production engineer with BAE Systems at their shipyards in Glasgow, and then MP for Glasgow North East from 2017 to 2019, when he served as the Shadow Under Secretary of State for Scotland. So a very, very broad ranging career. And I'm delighted that we have someone from the shipbuilding industry to tell us about Rankin's legacy in shipbuilding. Over to you, Paul. Good morning, and it's a real privilege to be invited along um, this morning to take part in the Rankin 2020 conference. Obviously, we're much nicer to have uh, seen you all in person um, at Glasgow University um, to commemorate this, you know, fantastic uh, bicentenary event. Um, marking the life of, of William Rankin, one of the foremost geniuses in, in Scottish engineering history, um, a contribution that goes far beyond Clydeside, Glasgow, Scotland, even to it's a continuing global legacy. Even in his own lifetime, really, he, he planted those seeds that would very quickly germinate into a global impact, um, not just in thermodynamics, which is where he's probably most regarded as a, a leading innovator, but also in, in shipbuilding, which is really the legacy that I wish to focus on in my um, remarks this morning to you. Um, and my own background grew out of the Clyde shipbuilding industry, um, having joined BE Systems um, as a graduate. But the, the legacy of those pioneers um, in the 19th century still loomed large over the industry to this day. And I'll point out the direct connections with the industry that continues on Clydeside today as well as internationally. The impact of Rankin um, was one of fortuitous timing more than anything else. Um, when Rankin arrived in Glasgow in the 1850s, um, the city was entering into a high gear um, in terms of its industrial and commercial expansion. And Rankin's philosophy that he brought to bear on the city really had a profound effect. And we'll discuss that in some detail as we go through. And that's why I've kind of titled the theme of the lecture I'm giving today or this, this the seminar, um, one about disruptive change. So it's really that idea that his contribution was one of disruption um, in a positive sense that drove innovation um, that culminated in, in the Clyde being well established as the world leading center of, of shipbuilding and marine engineering uh, by the end of the 19th century. Um, and to point out the, the Though Rankin only lived a short, relatively short time, um, by the time he did uh, pass away in 1872, Clydeside was already well established as the world's largest concentration of marine engineering and shipbuilding work. So when he arrived on the scene in the 1850s, he was well placed with his outlook and thinking about the nature of engineering and its role in society um, to really have a, an effective um, influence over what was going on in the city at that time. And my goodness, it was a, a really profound influence, not just in Glasgow, but across Britain and internationally. Um, and really, to, to set it in context, what was going on, um, it was really the pioneering generations of engineers on Clydeside that changed the nature of global sea transportation. And that was driven not just through um, commercial know-how or entrepreneurialism, um, or some sort of competitive advantage in that sense, but it was really driven by practical application of innovation. And really the, the kind of key moment, really second only probably to, to James Watt's um, pioneering of, of the separate condenser was the um, patenting in 1853 of the compound steam engine by John Elder um, and its application from 1854 onwards that improved the fuel efficiency of steamships by up to 40% and enabling long distance destinations to be reached, including navigation well into the Pacific Ocean. Um, and that was a transformative change uh, in Clyde shipbuilding. And of course, after uh, Rankin, Rankin's death, the next big innovation that came forward was the introduction of the triple expansion steam engine that further drove forward the Clyde's competitive advantage internationally. Um, and we'll discuss the sort of interactions between these key figures, the, the Napiers and the elders that um, there were the two key dynasties, if you like, on, on the Clyde side of that time, but many others as well. 
um, Henry Dyer, um, Jane G. Thompson. Um, these were all key people who were interacting um, and collaborating um, during that time. And of course, Robert Napier is often described as the father of Clyde shipbuilding, but David Elder is, is really the, the, the father of um, marine engineering on the Clyde. And, and the marriage of these two disciplines um, really gives the Clyde that global competitive advantage um, that makes it a world leader. And Rankin was very much the academic powerhouse um, that interfaced with those um, more industrial figures um, to really act as a catalyst um, to applying the scientific uh, rigour um, to studying, maximising the efficiency of these engines and these engineering um, applications. And I think that really speaks to his broader philosophy as well um, when it comes to um, his role in transforming um, natural philosophy if you like, into a, a discrete engineering discipline. Um, you can see here at the end of the, the 19th century, uh, over 40 shipyards located on the River Clyde, over 100,000 people employed in shipbuilding and marine engineering, and tens of thousands more in ancillary industries. And that achievement was in no small part to the thinker, uh, William Rankin, and his connection with these industrial figures in Clydeside around the mid-19th century, Napier and Elder. And it really was an incredible story of global proportions, the, the genius that, that came together um, in that way at that time. Very opportune for us all, really, um, that it did happen. And looking down on that scene, you, you can see Govan um, there, and in the foreground, the shipyard where the Napiers um, really began the story of significant clay ship building on the upper reaches of the river and where Rankin's theories uh, and assistance really brought to bear their growth and development into a world beater. And of course, just further upstream, um, you can see the giant Titan crane, giant cantilever crane of, of Fairfield, where Elder would set out the world's first uh, integrated shipbuilding and marine engine works. Um, so these are the and within that small space of geography, within just a couple of square miles, you see changes that had global impact on the evolution of shipbuilding worldwide. Um, and it's quite a remarkable thing to think that that all took place within basically two decades, um, from the 1850s to the 1870s. It was a really intensive period of innovation and growth, and, and Rankin was very much in the thick of that. And to set the scene, of course, Rankin um, arrived in Glasgow in the 1850s, but of course a lot of innovation was going on well long before then, of course, in as early as 1812, we have Henry Bell's Comet, we have Symington's work with the Charlotte Dundas uh, on the Fourth of Clyde Canal, etc. Um, but of course, Napier is a, is a key figure in the development of, of Clyde shipbuilding um, in his own right, someone who has very rightly been entered into the Scottish Engineering Hall of Fame, along with Rankin. Um, but his collaborations were significant, not just his practical advance of the, the steam engine, um, but also his work commercially with partners such as Sam Cunard, and of course the Cunard Line, one of the most famous transatlantic shipping lines. Um, and it just demonstrates the commercial application of that engineering know-how and the ability to harness that potential in, a, in an industrial growth um, that has a huge impact for the industrialization of Scotland and of course in Glasgow itself, the most intensive industrialization of anywhere in the world at that time. So a remarkable achievement. And of course, you can see an example of that, the, the Britannia of 1840, the first Cunard transatlantic liner built in the Clyde, um, which gave rise to a relationship that carried on well across um, a century and more until the construction of the QE2 in the late 1960s. So uh, you're setting in place uh, a series of relationships and interactions that had huge implications for the historical development of, of Glasgow at that time. Um, and of course, here we have the, the Persia um, of 1856, which won the Blue Riband um, for the fastest crossing of the North Atlantic also struck an iceberg on its maiden voyage, but it was so uh, sturdily built that it managed to survive that uh, collision, uh, unlike the, the Titanic uh, over half a century later. Um, and the factors at play, of course, um, 
in the wider sense that Britain had developed a large colonial empire, um, which required a, ma a large merchant marine fleet to service its routes. And of course, the map indicates the huge array of routes. And of course, the efficiency of marine engineering was critical to improving that reach across the world, this first great wave of globalization. And the Clyde was very much at the bleeding edge of that and driving that forward um, in a hitherto unknown way that the world was being reduced in scale and size. And two sides of that were not just the, the merchant marine uh, building fleets. Um, of course, Britain had at that time the world's largest merchant marine, so ready demand for, for that um, industry uh, on the Clyde. But of course, there was also the development of naval shipbuilding as well on the Clyde. Uh, and this is a key opportunity where Rankin has a significant influence along with Napier um, and changing the dynamics of how Britain built its ships for the Navy um, as well as the um, merchant marine fleets. And that really is the combination of those factors that drive the Clyde towards world leadership in, in shipbuilding for over a century. And it's an incredible story um, and, and one that probably ought to be much more widely known. Uh, often people say that shipbuilding is Glasgow's creation myth, if you like. Um, but in reality, um, it was driven by this generation within 20 years, they set the seeds for global preeminence. Uh, and really part of that interface is as it as was dubbed in one of um, the historical accounts of Rankin's life, where the town meets the gown. And of course, at that period, Glasgow University is moving from the high street to Gilmore Hill, a new campus being built. It opens officially in 1870. And that's a critical factor in, in, in Rankin's um, philosophy when he arrives in the city. Of course, he already had a burgeoning scientific career, but he also wanted to increasingly engage with engineering commitments. Um, and then by, by 1851, he'd, he'd moved his centre of focus in Scotland from, from Edinburgh to Glasgow uh, and was establishing himself, not just in regards to commercial engineering projects, but also very much in the improvement of the city uh, and projects such as um, the promotion of a submarine telegraph between Britain and Ireland, along with Lord Kelvin. And of course, um, the ambitious scheme of Lawrence Hill um, and Lewis Gordon to develop a fresh water supply for Glasgow from Loch Catherine, which was eventually developed by Bateman um, and had a transformative effect on public health of the city, of course. But he, by 1855, had succeeded Gordon uh, in the region's chair of civil engineering mechanics um, and really set the scene for what he was trying to achieve um, in his inaugural address, where he was talking about this idea of application of theory to practice. And that really, that harmonious idea um, of a, a theory practice and application of theory to practice, that kind of tripartite, kind of triple helix, if you like, um, gave rise to a new breed of engineering science um, that would bridge the theoretical and practical. And that's really the philosophy that is hugely influential for, for um, developing shipbuilding on the Clyde. Um, and he engages with these commercial industrial figures in Glasgow, of course, founding the new um, Institute of Engineers in Scotland, in which eventually became the Institute of Engineers and Shipbuilders in Scotland in 1857, um, with his colleague at the time, um, Walter Nielsen, who was a locomotive engineer, but also heavily involved with Rankin and Elder. Um, so this is a huge moment for the integration of research and academia and industry in Glasgow. And of course, you can see here um, his magnum opus, if you like, for shipbuilding, shipbuilding theoretical and practical um, on the left there, co-authored with, with um, Robert Napier, Frederick Barnes and Isaac Watts. Um, a hugely influential um, moment in the evolution of ship science, um, where really the practical aspects of shipbuilding were truly developed. Um, and that kind of started with an engagement with um, James Robert Napier, Robert Napier's son, in trying to improve the efficiency of a Russian um, pocket, uh, packet steamer um, that was supplied between Riga and St. Petersburg 
um, called the Admiral, and he was trying to figure out ways in which that the efficiency of the ship could be improved. And his contribution to that was significant um, in developing a scientific um, approach um, to studying the efficiency of shipbuilding and the hull design and the hydrodynamics of hull design. And he um, was able to pioneer the development of that um, rigorous approach to ship science. Um, it's truly a huge moment in the evolution of shipbuilding and marine engineering on the Clyde. And they're the two main figures that Rankin, of course, worked with on the left, Robert Napier and his son uh, on the right hand side as well, uh, <clears throat> James uh, Robert Napier. And I think it's these interactions that are really critical to the improvement um, and growth of shipbuilding on the Clydes um, that really give rise to an incredible engineering breakthrough. Um, and of course, his work in developing this rigorous approach to ship science and efficiency uh, attracts the interests of the Royal Navy and the Admiralty. And that is a hugely significant point because this leads to a commercial breakthrough where previously the Royal Dockyards, um, Chatham, Portsmouth, etc., um, had a monopoly on naval ship construction. Um, the Napiers, with Rankin's assistance, are able to break through with the winning of the war of one of the first ironclad warships, uh, the Black Prince, in 1860. Um, sister ship of HMS Warrior, which you can still visit at Portsmouth Historic Dockyard. Um, the Black Prince does not without its technical problems when it was constructed, um, really established um, the Clyde's capability in warship building and challenges the dominance of the Thames and the Royal Dockyards. Um, and of course, he becomes increasingly recognised, Rankin, as, a, as an expert in ship science and is involved with Robert Napier and the Black Prince, but also involved uh, in further development of naval shipbuilding rules and design after the disaster of HMS Captain, which capsized. He is involved in a scientific committee of investigation and creates a new series of rules and um, design standards that govern naval shipbuilding at that point in 1870. So he has a huge influence over the development of that um, in the longer term. And that is a, a significant contribution to breaking through um, the Clyde's impact and driving um, naval shipbuilding as well as commercial shipbuilding. And he also heavily influenced the thinking of John Elder as well. Uh, John Elder, an incredible engineer um, and someone that Rankin developed a very close and harmonious relationship with to the point where um, John Elder, after dying very young as well um, in 1870, uh, Rankin was moved to write a memoir um, of John Elder and his contribution. And you can see a um, copy of that front cover on the slide there with John Elder's image on the left. And Elder really built on that reputation of rank and he really built on that legacy. Um, that he, he thoroughly studied, understood the principles of the then pretty much novel science of thermodynamics and of course drove those innovations of the compound steam engine uh, and the triple expansion steam engine um, that led to the massive growth of Clyde shipbuilding through the 1850s and to the 1870s. Um, but not only that, he pioneered the very first purpose built engine works at Centre Street, um, which you can see here, sadly demolished. Uh, it's photographed from John Hume in the 1960s, just before it was demolished. But also, more crucially, after beginning shipbuilding in a rudimentary sense, uh, using one of Napier's old shipyards in Govan. He realised that the real breakthrough for commercial shipbuilding and naval shipbuilding in, in Scotland really needed to lie in the integration of the two uh, disciplines and led to the creation of the first integrated shipbuilding marine engine works in the world, uh, laid out in 1864, completed just after John Elder's untimely death in 1870 um, in Govan. So it still stands to this day as the, the last major shipbuilder on the Clyde. Um, a really lasting legacy, which Rankin was at the forefront of, along with Elder. Um, 
and not only that, his legacy was international. Um, the university's first chair of naval architecture at Glasgow, founded in 1883, resulted in the friendship between Professor Rankin and John Elder. Of course, after Elder's death, his widow Isabella endowed the chair as a memorial to her husband, and it continues today uh, after a merger between Strathclyde and Glasgow Universities um, as the Department of Naval Architecture and Marine Engineering, uh, and the building it's contained in is named after Henry Dyer, yet another um, key figure that was influenced by Rankin's legacy. Um, on the recommendation of Rankin, he was offered the post of Professor of Civil and Mechanical Engineering and founding principal of the Imperial College of Engineering in Tokyo, um, that was designing, uh, designed and set up to train the first generation of modern engineers for the newly opened Japan after the Meiji Restoration. Uh, and just 25 years old, Rankin had already spotted his potential uh, and gave him that key breakthrough that led not just to the development of engineering and shipbuilding in the Clyde, but actually opened up Japan as a major centre for shipbuilding and marine engineering, which continues to this day as one of the world's leading shipbuilding nations. So it really has a huge impact uh, across the world. Uh, and Henry Dyer is, of course, membered. Um, having come back to Glasgow in the 1880s and still contributed to the growth of engineering education in the city. So it's a hugely significant legacy that he's left to the Clydes and the wider world. And of course, that legacy from Randolph Elder Napier runs right through uh, the Clyde shipyards to the current day where the shipyard in Govan continues to work uh, and operate along the same principles um, of integrated shipbuilding marine engine works. Um, as it was when it was set up um, by Elder and with the influence of Rankin. So it's a, a hugely significant impact that he had. Um, and of course, his influence um, shown through this evolution is hugely important. That's an image of um, the Fairfield Yard laid out there um, in its earliest conception and as it grows through to the present day. Um, you can see that that continuation, that fundamental model stays there. And that same layout was adopted by J. G. Thompson, similarly influenced by Rankin and Napier um, for the layout of their Clyde Bank shipyard, which of course became John Brown's, builder of some of the biggest ships in the world through the, the 20th century. Um, his philosophy, his willingness to break the barriers, the silos between the academic and commercial worlds really make a huge impact. His contribution as a principal author of shipbuilding theoretical and practical, his numerous papers in hydrodynamics, um, following simple principles, but hungry to apply them in a commercial sense, in a practical sense, learn from them, test them, adjust them, uh, refine them, um, working in dialogue with men of practice, uh, great engineering geniuses like Napier and Elder, they were able to successfully combine considerations of fluid flow, geometry of shipbuilding, engine propulsion, hull resistance, um, and of course, most importantly, um, found a new practical object for energy, physics, and the science, jointly developed with William Froude and others of naval dynamics and hydrodynamics. Um, he truly was a, a pioneering genius in the development of global shipbuilding. Uh, and gave that early lead to the Clyde in the mid-19th century that resulted in its global leadership and effectiveness as a, a world-leading centre of shipbuilding and marine engineering. Uh, and for that, you know, it's a legacy that we can be truly proud of as a country, but something that possibly we ought to not know a lot more about. Uh, and I think if this seminar and these discussions can help to promote that in a more robust way across our country, then that can only be a good thing. It was a great tragedy that he died unmarried, you know, very early in his life um, in 1872. Um, and it just seemed to be a, a real ro robbery of potential um, to think that what he was achieved in those 20 years after arriving in, in Glasgow in the 1850s through to the 1870s, what more could he have achieved? Similarly with John Elder, who died at a very young age. Um, but what they did achieve was truly immortal in the sense that it continues to contribute
to the heart of our understanding of ship science to this day and the growth commercially of shipbuilding engineering left a legacy in Glasgow that's indelible in the city and the country's identity of itself through the industrial era. Um, is pioneering efforts to marry the idea of shipbuilding, marine engineering with academic research is something that we could learn a lot more from today in terms of how does Scotland's potential improve as an industrial country uh, into the next industrial revolution, into the so-called green industrial revolution. How do we learn the lessons of what Rankin Elder and uh, Napier achieved with their other industrial and, and academic partners? I think that's a great story that we can have much more discussion about. Um, but hopefully that brief fly through of, of his contribution to the growth of shipbuilding and engineering on the Clydes and the world really um, was insightful and, and offers a view on his work that is perhaps often often overlooked. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul, for that fantastic overview. It was really interesting to see how the Fairfield Yard has grown over the years. That was excellent. For those of you 